Welcome to another CAE Defense and Security Podcast. On this platform, we connect with our listeners to share inspirational stories, discuss new technologies, and exchange thoughts on a range of topics relevant to the global defense market. Check us out at cae.com forward slash defense dash security forward slash, or subscribe on your podcasting platform of choice. Hello, everyone. My name is Maurice Carmichael. I'm the uh, Training Center Operations Manager at CAE Defense and Security Canada, and I'm also a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Welcome to CAE's uh, Defense and Security Podcast. Here with me today, I have the tremendous, tremendous pleasure of hosting three highly inspiring women from the defense and the civil aviation sector. First, we have Roberta Jameson. She's the Director of Training Services for CAE USA in Tampa, Florida. And then we have Christina Renteria. She is the Chief Pilot at Stag Air. Howdy, y'all. Nice to be here tonight. And then we also have Nilofar Romani, former first Afghan female pilot. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Really our pleasure to have uh, all three of you uh, today. So during today's podcast, we will talk about the roles where women uh, are still a minority as Air Force pilots or civil pilots. Um, these three amazing women will uh, share with us their professional life experiences and the pursuit of their dreams. So let me start with Christina. Christina, where did your inspiration come from to become a pilot? Well, howdy, guys. I'm I'm so happy to be here tonight and be able to share a little bit of my story with y'all. And starting off, I was the kid that grew up loving airplanes, had them hanging from my ceiling. My uh, my stepdad is the one that really inspired me to get into aviation and pursue it. He used to take me on uh, father-daughter dates and we'd get burgers and sit at the end of the runway in Houston and watch the airlines land. And it just really inspired me and gave me that spark from the beginning to be able to fly. And I actually started training once I was in high school to fulfill his dream of becoming a pilot. He's had a heart transplant, so he wasn't able to get his own license. And we found out he was going to need a second one whenever I was older. And it was kind of a, a just in case type deal. I wanted to be able to fulfill that dream and be able to take him flying. And at first the plan was just to get my private and it turned out I really liked it and was really good at it. And so I just never stopped training and progressed to where I am now about 10 years later. Wonderful to hear. Family mm -hmm. often has a, a big part to play in the inspiration, that's for sure. Yes. Um, Roberta, today uh, you manage the, uh, the training services organization at CAE uh, USA Tampa. Uh, but in your prior Air Force career, uh, you were in the original class of uh, women that uh, pilots in 1980 with the USAF and also one of the first combat rated uh, C-130 pilots uh, there. Where did your dream of, uh, of flying and becoming a military pilot come from? So uh, back in the Stone Ages, uh, where I came from, uh, women weren't given the opportunity to fly in the military, and actually was to be in the military. And I had a, a four-year uh, Air Force ROTC scholarship. I was in my fourth year, I already had an assignment. I was going over to uh, Europe. I was really excited about that. And lo and behold, the Air Force opened up a very small number of slots for women in Air Force ROTC to go to pilot training women in my ROTC class, I was the only one that had the physical qualifications, the eyesight, the, the other issues they look for. And so I uh, applied. I was uh, straightforward. I was very nervous about applying because I'd never flown a plane. I didn't know if I had the skills or the talents. And I also knew I was going into a career field where uh, mostly male dominated. So I was, uh, you know, I was young. I was nervous about all of that. But I think in the end, what it came down to was I didn't want to have regrets. I did 60s, sitting in a rocking chair and wondering, what if? What if I had done that? So it was a leap of faith for me. And I do think it was a God thing. 
But I'll tell you, it was it was so right. And the opportunities and the challenges that that I got to experience in my 20 years, I would have never had that opportunities if I hadn't made that decision. I love the fact that you're mentioning. I love the fact that you're mentioning, you know, (laughs) thinking about when you're 60 or 70 and then, you know, would you regret it? And of course, you have uh, you have to go and try it and uh, and go in the pursuit of your dreams for sure. Um, last but not least, Nilfar, I think um, of, uh, of all of us, you, uh, you, uh, you pursued your dream of becoming a pilot. Uh, please tell me about your experience with the uh, Afghan Air Force. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here among all this amazing women that I don't think my story is as like, too important because we have so many other amazing women that they fight for their rights and they do want to pursue their dreams. And um, I'm one of them as well. So uh, my journey, of course, because uh, I was a little girl and since I was born, I think I just didn't want it to come to this world because I was born in Afghanistan. By the time I was was born, the country was in war and Afghanistan has a story of over 35 years of war. And as a little girl, I became a refugee. I lived 10 years of my life under a camp, refugee camp, and I wasn't able to go to school. And I wasn't able to be educated, just to have uh, freedom and be educated. That was a big deal for me. And that was back then, that was a whole dream I wanted to have, just to be educated, just to be allowed to go to school. And because I have faced so many challenges in my uh, life as a child, and Growing up and go back to my country, I would see those uh, U.S. Air Force fighter jets that they would fly over Afghanistan's sky, and it would be just fascinating. And I would look at them, and I would lay in the balcony. I would just look at them, and it would amaze me. And beside that, uh, my father, he always wanted to be a pilot. But unfortunately, with the situation in Afghanistan, things are sometimes not really fair. You get only if you have a connection or you are from a very um, high class family or you have money. And unfortunately, he never could pursue his dreams. And in Afghanistan, if you are a woman, uh, not so many families count on you. Always they count on a male. If you have a son, that's the whole pride that they have. So as a woman, I wanted to pursue this dream not only for myself, for my father and also for all the other girls that entire this years of war in the country, they couldn't, uh, they've been always silent and they never could pursue their dreams because they were always told to not do, this is not their place. Their place is only to just get married and have babies, but that's not right. And um, all these reasons um, made me to be where I am now and also the love of uh, flying. It always been with me, I guess. If not, as a child, I didn't know to be a pilot. I always wanted to be a bird. That's what I know because I was so tired of being in this world with all these violent people. But uh, yes, that was uh, where my journey started and that never stopped. And it never went away from my mind and my heart. Nilofar, you mentioned already some of the obstacles that you face. Uh, of course, uh, we've all faced some in, in non-traditional roles, but for you, even more uh, in society and just even getting to becoming a pilot. Once you became a pilot with the Afghan Air Force, what did you face uh, any other obstacles that were really um, uh, because you were a pilot? Absolutely, because in Afghanistan, uh, you're actually, as a woman, you're not only allowed to go to school, be it wearing a uniform, being in the military, and besides just not only wearing a uniform, being a pilot, that was something really shocking for the people and uh, the male in US Air, uh, Afghan Air Force because none of them, this was very uh, surprise thing for them. And the tradition and the culture is, was not allowing them to accept this. Of course, I got rejected by flight doctors. Um, they just wanted to reject me to be not qualified, but I had to fight for that. Uh, Thank God with the support of US Air Force, they helped me through entire process. 
that I had to get through this flight physical because they wanted to reject it uh, and not have me there. Plus, and all the challenges and obstacles that I had to face uh, from my coworkers that um, having me in the squadron, it was a shame for them just only being a female and fly the same airplane as they do. It was shameful for them because as a man, it would make them uh, look weak that oh, if a female can fly an airplane, you can do it as well. So you guys are kind of doing the same thing and you are no better than a female. So I had to fight against all of those. And every day I had to hear that I will crash an airplane. I will crash an airplane. And how am I allowed to even be here? So it has been so many, um, but that I think that made me strong and that made me to finish the training and be um, where I wanted to be and be where I belong to be. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Uh, Roberta, I'd like to go to you now because um, as I've seen the Royal Canadian Air Force evolve, I know the U.S. Air Force has also evolved a great deal over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Please tell me about being in the original class and then, and then the, some of the obstacles you faced throughout uh, your career and, and what did you do to overcome them? Yes, um, I don't think anything as difficult as, as, as what was just described and how admirable uh, and how courageous. I, I just, it gives me chills. So I, I, um, I'm just overwhelmed by that story. Um, I wasn't the first class of women to go through pilot training. There were two of us uh, in each of the flights when we first started. And uh, it took, you know, at that point in time, it was a year long process. And, and both of us made it through, which I was very proud of. And yes, there were, there were obstacles and there were jokes and there were, um, you know, deliberate roadblocks put in our way. Uh, what I'll say is that um, I stayed focused on doing the very best job I could every day. And I didn't, I didn't focus. I didn't let the barriers and the obstacles be, you know, in my way. It was out of my mind and just, you know, applied myself as hard as I knew how to do. And in the end, um, you know, I graduated. And I also had this, I would say to myself, as I looked around the class, and, you know, at all, the, all my classmates, and um, I thought about all of the, the, the men that had been through this before. And I said, you know, make it, I can make it. I know I can do this. <laughs> and I would say that resiliency is very important when you're facing these barriers and you just need to work on your skills and don't allow those barriers to hold you back. Uh, much like the, you know, the, the story that was just shared, you know, just figure out how to work around those barriers instead of allowing them to get in your way and be successful. And I don't, I have lots of stories, but I, I don't, uh, I, I don't want to really go into any specifics, but I can if you want. But I think you just uh, summarized it uh, really, really well when you, you talk about focus and resiliency and, and, uh, and, and being able to just really look at the, the objective and do everything you need to do to, uh, to get your wings in your case. And same thing, I think, for Nilofar uh, um, in Afghanistan. Uh, I'd like to turn it to Christina. Christina, you're a little bit younger than I am, and, and I'm sure you have a different, uh, totally different experience. Uh, please tell me about your experience and, and some of the, the, the current obstacles, perhaps, that you are facing and, and what you're doing to, uh, to overcome them. You know, it's incredibly humbling listening to you guys because you hear stories like that in not just aviation, but roadblocks for women in general. And it's hard to believe that so much of that still exists. And I, I guess I've been very blessed and humbled that I haven't had anything quite so severe in, in my career. Um, some of my biggest roadblocks, I guess, have actually come from other women and them not being comfortable with me flying with their husbands <laughs> who are pilots or for their husbands who are the passengers. And surprisingly, I know Texas gets a really bad rap sometimes for being conservative and stuck in the dark ages, but my bosses and most of the pilots that I have met here have been just so welcoming and encouraging. 
for women to fly, not just myself, but I have a few other friends that are female pilots. And overall, it's it's been generally positive. And so it just it breaks my heart to to hear some of y'all's other stories. But I'm so proud of the examples that you guys have have said and everything that y'all have overcome to be where you're at today. Thank you. And I love the link that you're making. And, and yes, uh, the colleagues, I think, and bosses are so important uh, in the success of women, you know, having some really supportive colleagues and, and good mentors and bosses that certainly makes a big difference. Um, speaking about that and, and how to gain the respect of the male colleagues, perhaps, Christina, if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, what are some of the, the tips and the tricks that you have to to ensure that uh, that you uh, gain the respect of the male colleagues? Well, it's something that took time. I've been working at the current airfield that I'm at now for about five years. And I think it's kind of like with anybody due to the field, you kind of have to earn your stripes a little bit and uh, show everyone what you're made of. But something that's really helped me is showing up on time, present yourself professionally, you know, dress appropriately and always treat everyone else with respect. I'm a true believer that you get what you put out in the world. And so I've always tried to treat everyone with respect because you never know who the person in the back of the airplane or the person that could be hiring you for your next job is going to be. And so I think that that's a really good way to not only get farther in life, but also character building and um, makes each of us a better person. And so through time doing those things, it has definitely helped to build up respect and rapport both with colleagues and with clients. So those are my main things that, that I do mm -hmm. to practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Christina. Roberta, I'd like to maybe uh, touch on a different angle, not only uh, your colleagues and, and superior, but now you're leading a, a large organization with, I would say, probably a very high number of your employees are, are male. So uh, do you lead differently uh, being, a, being a woman? Do you, um, do you have some special advice for, for women that then evolve and then become in charge of organizations that are mainly uh, male-oriented and, and composed of men? It's so funny. When I first got out of the military and started in the civilian sector, I, it, it struck me just one day, I'm sitting in a, a meeting, and it just struck me, I'm the only woman in this meeting. <laughs> and, you know, I never even, it, it never even dawned on me. But after that point, it, it became, it, it became something for. And I often wondered what the perception was of the uh, males in the room, you know, if they, if that was obvious to them, or if they even thought about it. Uh, and I just throw that out, because even now, I'm in, in this career field, but still we're definitely a minority. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, you, don't, you don't want to lose your uniqueness as a woman. We bring different things to the workplace. Uh, we bring emotional intelligence to the workplace, and that's appreciated, and it's important. I think, uh, and I'm not, I'm not being, um, you know, I'm, this is a general statement, but I think uh, women are much better at emotional intelligence in the workplace. And I'm a server leader, so I'm, I'm very devoted to that. And I'm also uh, big on mentorship. <clears throat> and I'm, um, I would say that that's very important, too, in, in the way I lead. I think, finally, uh, you have to stand up for yourself, and, but you have to do it in a respectful but manner and show confidence. And uh, that's something that doesn't always come naturally. So there are times that I have to you know, psych myself up for that so that I'm, I'm ready for those situations. That, but that does gain respect and, um, and it's important. I think, Roberta, I uh, you and me probably have uh, something in common in Nilofar as well, having been in, in uh, the Air Force or part of a, a forces group was uh, wearing the uniform is one thing because you walk in, if, uh, I remember being the commander, walking into a room, everyone would know uh, who I was, when you walk into a boardroom uh, at CAE or in the corporate world, it's different because people don't know who you are and, and what you're bringing. That's true. That, that yeah, makes absolutely. a big difference at times. Yes. That's a good Nilo, point. Yeah, Nilofar, uh, please uh, talk to me about perhaps the difference now um, uh, when you were in Afghanistan or in your life now, 
um, working with male colleagues, working with uh, uh, other uh, maybe uh, flying instructors, male flying instructors. Tell me about the relationship and, and what you see and the difference between um, the Afghan Air Force and what you're doing now and how you're evolving. Well, it's absolutely different because all I had to see was disrespect. And, um, you know, just as a woman, they always looked down to me, honestly. And didn't matter how hard I had to work, no matter how harder than everyone else I had to work, which was the hard part for me because when you look at the other world, the women in that um, they have uh, maybe um, in other countries, women won't see it that way. But for me, coming from Afghanistan, I can see the big difference because in here you can be anyone, you can do anything you want to do. There's no barriers and nobody can stop you. You want to be an astronaut? Yes, you can be an astronaut if you just want to be and you aim for it. But unfortunately for me, um, it took a little bit longer than I thought because um, back in Afghanistan, um, I had to prove myself. I had to work hard. And as they would look as like as a woman that I cannot do combat mission or I cannot do a mission that involved with HRs or human remain bodies. And I had to work for that. I had to say no to it. I had to sometimes ignore the, the com um the order just because we're a good change. And uh, according to our law, which is only in our law, not in any other IKO or FAA, I'm, I'm sure it's not, that a woman pilot is not able to fly HR mission, which is the human uh, remain body in the military. And as you know, in Afghanistan, it's a battlefield. Most of the uh, cities in Afghanistan is, is still under uh, Taliban control or ISIS control. And there was lots of Afghan soldiers. They would lose their life and they will be killed. And as a pilot, our job, our duty was to go and uh, bring their bodies to their families or if uh, they needed any treatments or uh, a Kazakh mission. But um, it was written that as a woman, I wasn't able to do this mission, which was really painful for me because when they would look at me as a weak woman, that I would get um, very emotional and it would affect my ability and my skill, which was 100 percent not true. And um, I had to ignore that order and I was ready for it. Even if I had to lose my wings, I was ready for that because I wanted to bring that change. I didn't want a woman that comes after me. She would think why they stopped me from doing this? What I love to do this? What if I love that to help someone to help them um, like bring their bodies or that's the last thing their families had to have from them. And I had to just ignore some orders to be able to break those um, barriers. And that sometimes among, still among the older pilot, um, it was very different. The older pilots male pilots, they treated me so much better than the younger one. And the only reason is because the older generation, they were born, they were raised during the 60s when there was a respect, there was a uh, rule and there was a right for women. Women could be anything that they want to be. They could do anything that they want to do and nothing would stop them. And unfortunately, the younger generation were the one that they grew up in Taliban violence and during the war, that their mentality was completely wrong. And it was hard for me as a woman to change that mentality. But um, I'm still glad that at least I could change some of them, but not all of them, which is still makes breaks my heart. But the big difference is that in the United States, it is so different because I get to fly with my instructors uh, um, because they treat me the same as other male pilots. There is no difference. They see me the same, and I never get, uh, nobody hurts my feeling that I'm a woman and I would crash the airplane, which is amazing. And that makes other countries or this country the best country in the world, that if you want to be who you want to be, and, and of course, I believe in yourself, you can do anything you want to do. And there's nothing to stop you. And uh, no matter how hard or easy that can be, but you have to just do it yourself. There's no nobody or nothing stops you.
what strength of character you have, Nilofar. I'm so, so first, I have to say we're only halfway through the interview, but uh, I'm mm-hmm. delighted to get to know you better today. Uh, thank, thank you, you. For, for discussing this. Um, I would like to, 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 we've talked a little bit about obstacles and about uh, working in a male dominated world. Let's just talk pure flying and, and, <laughs> and what you love about flying and what brought you and, and when, when you're flying, what brings you the most joy? What do you like the most uh, about flying? Nilofar, let's start with you. Oh, thank you. Well, I go back to my childhood because as a child, I was so tired of, honestly, the people and the world and the wildlife. Because as soon as I opened my eyes, I just saw wildlife. And um, sometimes I would sit in the refugee camp under our tent and I would look at the sky that the birds are flying away. And I would just, as a child, I didn't know there's, you can be pilot because I never knew pilot exists or what the pilot is. So I w- all I could think of is, um, what if I was a bird? Just go and as high as I can go and just run away from this world. And um, the love of being up there. And sometimes I feel like that's exactly where I belong is because that brings once I'm in the sky and once I, my wheels, my airplane wheels lift this ground and I feel like a free human. I feel like all the stress, all the struggles, all the problems, all the dangers, anything that it's my life and I it bothers me while I'm here and it just make me think about it and it hurts me. And as soon as I'm up there, I don't think of anything else. All I think is just myself, my airplane, the sky and that moment. And I don't think about anything and that comes naturally. And it just, everything is just washed away from my brain and I never get to think about them. Even if I want to, there's no time for thinking about that stuff. <laughs> Very good, absolutely. The, the pure pleasure of flying. Uh, Roberta, how about you? How about, uh, what do you really love about flying and what, uh, what draws you to, uh, to flying? So the, uh, the airplane is the great equalizer. You can get in the airplane, get behind the yoke or the stick. It doesn't know if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't know if you're short or tall, black or white. It's all of your skills, your reactions, your decision making that makes the difference uh, between a successful and unsuccessful flight. And I, I will echo what what was said before: it's the freedom and it's the it's the instant gratification. When you put an input in, you know right away if you did it right or wrong. It's 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 instant gratification. The aircraft will tell you. So it's both of those things together. And um, but I would have to go back to the freedom. And it's almost like yoga, yoga like I do yoga and doing yoga and you're really focusing on it. That's all you're thinking about. And you walk away from yoga and you just feel like a different person. And flying an airplane is the same way, because when you're in the, the in that aircraft, that's what you're focusing on. And, and so I, I can't think of a better way to describe it. Absolutely, absolutely. Christina, how about you? Talk to me about uh, what, what, uh, what you love about the flying. Well, you guys must be mind readers because freedom was the first thing that popped into my mind as well. <laughs> uh, I started trading when I was 18 years old living in Houston. And there was something about going to high school and then at night being able to get up in a little 172 and fly over downtown and see those lights. And, you know, I guess you couldn't see the cars individually, but just to see them going down the highway and it's, you leave all of the troubles and the cares of the world behind. And it's still true to this day, you know, maybe up at 40,000 feet instead of 3000 now. But the difference is, is that there's so much that goes on in the world that we don't control, you know, just family, politics, friends, so much. And when you take off, even if it's only for 30 minutes for an hour, you get to leave all of that behind and you are in control of everything for that time. You know, if there's an emergency, okay, you handle it. You have a checklist. The plane responds to your inputs. And there's something relaxing about that, that everything is up to you during that time. And the scenery is great too, of course, and relaxing, but <laughs> it's just freeing, absolutely freeing. Best way to phrase it for sure. 
Free like a bird, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, Christina, what would you have to say to young girls and to women? And actually, you know, to anyone listening to the, the podcast today about, uh, you know, following your dreams and, and breaking down barriers. What, what would be uh, the one piece of advice you would tell uh, people? I think that our biggest obstacle that we all face is our own fears and us telling ourselves that we can do it. You know, we're lucky enough to be in the United States, like Nilafar was saying, that this is the land of opportunity to where men and women can go and we can follow our dreams. And you just have to put in the work and the effort to go and do it. So don't let your gender or your age or your race stop you from ever believing in yourself for anything that you want to do, because you can and you will do it if you put your mind to it. For sure. Roberta, uh, how about you? What do you think? Uh... What is the best piece of advice for people to, uh, or for young, young girls when they talk about their dreams and how to really follow their dreams and, and break down barriers? Bring passion, bring your best game, and be confident in your abilities. That's my three things. <laughs> Do you think that was your recipe, those three things, uh, that Uh, through your your entire career yeah. you think that's what you can it took me a to while bring? to get the confidence but it, that's really important because if you don't have confidence you're not you're not going to succeed as a pilot you, you have to have that confidence and because you have to be able to express that to the people that are flying with you so that's really important but it, it may not come right away but it will absolutely absolutely very good uh, nilofar i think Passion, for sure. I think I see it in, in your eyes. Uh, what are some other tips and, and what would you say to when you meet with young girls? What do you say about um, the road ahead, about uh, making their dreams come true and, and breaking down barriers? All I can say is change will come if they choose to bring it. And it will be a time because We're all human, that we will die. We are not strong enough. We will think we are not worth enough or we are not smart enough. And that's normal. It's okay if we all feel that way because I felt the same way. But we should never let our fear to win. And we always have to believe in ourselves. And if, and the main thing is just to believe in yourself first, no matter what everyone else telling you, you are not able to do because they're either jealous or they don't want you to be better in life or do well for your life because we only get to live once and there's no second life. After we are done from living in this world, there's no second chance. And we were born to use or bring some changes in this world or use the best life or this life that God gave us. We should use it in a be best way that when we get in a certain age that we should never regret our past. Because every day passes, that's one of the important days that we lose. And every morning we wake up, we have to be appreciate that we have one more day to change or one more day to pursue our dreams. And as I say, it doesn't matter how big our dreams can be or it doesn't matter how small it can be. We just need to believe in ourselves and try to win and pursue it. Nilafar, I, I could not imagine better words to, to end this podcast today for CAE Defense and Security. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, I, I had never met you guys. Uh, I feel like I have new friends and I have uh, new colleagues that I want to continue this conversation with uh, later on. And I hope uh, people viewing today really enjoy getting to know uh, the three of you. So Roberta, Christina, Nilafar. Thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing your experiences. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. It was fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to CAE Defense and Security Podcast. If you want more information on CAE, please visit CAE.com.